Frontline World is made possible by ABB, a global provider of power and automation technologies. We enable our utility and industry customers all over the world to find solutions in their quest to improve performance and lower environmental impact. And by the William and Flora Hewlett Foundation, the John D. and Catherine T. MacArthur Foundation, the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, and by contributions to your PBS station from viewers like you. Thank you. Cambodians say that the souls of those who die without a proper burial continue to wander the earth. This is a place still haunted by their presence. In the 1970s, nearly two million people here were killed in the genocide. I came on a journey to Cambodia to find out why there's been no reckoning here. No trial, no truth commission. No public acknowledgement of what happened and who was responsible. But traveling in this country, you don't have to go far to find the evidence. On a road outside the capital, Phnom Penh, we found a woman whose story is like so many others. Her name is Samrit Poom. She remembers the night in 1977 when her husband didn't come home. Samrat later learned her husband had been executed as a supposed CIA spy. Not far from her home is the site of the former prison. The ground is still littered with the remains of execution victims. She says that any one of these bones could be her husband's. <laughs> Samrat is convinced she knows who is responsible for her husband's death. He lives just down the road from her, the former village chief, Choch. <laughs> Their village is one of thousands across the country, each with its own shrine filled with the bones of victims. One out of every four Cambodians died under the Khmer Rouge. Most of them will remain unknown and nameless. But like the Nazis, the Khmer Rouge kept meticulous prison records. Victims photographed in the last moments before they were tortured and killed. In Cambodia today, the killers live side by side with the families of their victims. We know from the prison records some of the leaders who gave those orders. Many of them are alive and free, living in the far northwest of the country. That's where we're headed. The road took us past Angkor Wat, through the spectacular ruins that symbolize Cambodia's former empire. The Khmer Rouge would invoke this legacy, 
recalling a Cambodia before it became a pawn of foreign powers. In the 1970s, the Vietnam War spilled into Cambodia. The United States bombed the country relentlessly. Out of the chaos, a small rebel army seized control of the countryside. Led by Pol Pot, the Khmer Rouge wanted to create an agrarian utopia and purge Cambodia of everything foreign or modern. They outlawed books, money, and medicine. They forced the entire population out of the cities and into work camps in the country. Many died of starvation and disease. They executed people who scavenged for food, who practiced their religion, who were educated. The reign of terror lasted four years. Heading north took us through what was once an inaccessible no-man's land. It's still heavily mined. We arrived in Anlong Vang. This dusty backwater was Pol Pot's jungle headquarters. When the Khmer Rouge were finally driven from power by the Vietnamese in 1979, they retreated here. They continued fighting a civil war until their surrender in 1998. We found our way to the local school. Just a few years ago, these kids were taught how to plant landmines. Now they're studying the history of 12th century Angkor Wat. This is the only history they'll learn. It was stunning that something so catastrophic could so soon become such a vague and distant memory. Down the road, we met a couple who should know what happened here. They were with the Khmer Rouge for over 30 years. Pic Chang was a Khmer Rouge general. He was also the Khmer Rouge ambassador to China. He's the one behind Pol Pot. His wife agrees. Young Maun was also close to Pol Pot. She was his personal cook. She remembers him fondly. This is the Pol Pot they say they knew. A friendly uncle. A father with his only daughter on the beach. It was hard to reconcile this image with Pol Pot the Executioner. Do I look like a savage person? That's what he said. And he didn't. Nate Thayer is a journalist, the only person to interview Pol Pot in the last 20 years. I wanted him to be remorseful. He wasn't. I wanted him to admit that innocent people uh, suffered because of his mistakes and that he was sorry. He never did. Uh, he made excuses.
Not far from the town of Anlong Vang is a dirt road that winds up into the Dangrik Mountains. Khmer Rouge families make the pilgrimage to visit Pol Pot's grave, the place where he was cremated and his ashes still remain. They pray for Pol Pot to bless their crops, educate their children and end their poverty. They call Pol Pot a champion of the poor, a defender of the country. The faithful sift through Pol Pot's ashes. They're looking for pieces of his bones. Pol Pot and his close comrades kept their role in the genocide secretive and obscure. But here in Tulslang prison, a school turned into a death camp, many thousands of victims were recorded and every execution was documented. The killings were approved by the man standing to the left of Pol Pot, Nguyen Chia, a mysterious figure barely known outside Cambodia. As Pol Pot's deputy, he was known as Brother Number Two. Nguyen Chia, in my view, is more guilty of crimes against humanity, war crimes, torture, and mass murder than any other single Cambodian. Nguyen Chia, there is just no question, is a mass murderer. Every single person who came through Tul Selang, Nguyen Chia was given a copy of the briefing of the torture and uh, remarked on when it was appropriate to uh, have them killed. We've been told that Nguyen Chia is still alive, living deep in the jungle near the Thai border. On our way, we came across an unexpected lead in a school for the sons and daughters of the Khmer Rouge cadre. Their teacher, Swan Sukun, was a Khmer Rouge official. When I was a little he was girl, the first person we met who admitted any responsibility. I, the main responsibility uh, were the leader. I, I think I, I was also responsible, but uh, at the uh, uh, lowest uh, degree, you know. In fact, Swan Sukun was Pol Pot's former assistant, and close enough to confirm the importance of the man we're hoping to find. Uh, is a Brother number two, chief of the security committee. He has a lot of documents against him. I think you know the the strongest man. I think after Pol Pot, I think Nunchia. He was the Pol Pot shadow. Yeah. Then, as we were leaving, we were told that this teenage girl is Pol Pot's daughter. She hasn't been seen for years. I have always been my pocket money on sweet. What is the mistake? Now she's learning English, a language her father once banned. Right. <laughs> We approached the last place the Khmer Rouge still control. As part of a peace agreement, they were given a small semi-autonomous zone, Pai Lin, along the border with Thailand. We know we're close when the potholed roads broaden to a smooth paved highway. 
this checkpoint marks the boundary between the government of Cambodia and the Khmer Rouge territory. A few years ago, Pailin was the main Khmer Rouge military stronghold, where some of the most pitched battles with the government were fought. The remnants of the Khmer Rouge still govern this area, and the senior leaders live here in peaceful retirement. Pailin is rich in rubies and sapphires. These gems used to fund the Khmer Rouge War. Now the profits go to the former commanders. Among the Khmer Rouge elite, we find their old puritanical communist world turned upside down. The former military commander and Pol Pot's nephew is now the Minister of Tourism. But his idea of a tourist attraction is a sculpture garden depicting the tortures of hell. The voice of Khmer Rouge propaganda now advises the lovelorn on the local disco station. The Khmer Rouge have turned from communism to karaoke. At night, this town in the middle of the jungle lights up like a low-rent Las Vegas. And judging from the floor show, the remnants of the regime have embraced all the vices they once outlawed. The red light district is packed with brothel shacks. Gambling is a regional obsession. The prime ticket in town? The spectacle of a mentally disabled man boxing a child. But not everyone has shared in the new Khmer Rouge prosperity. On the outskirts of town, the rank-and-file soldiers struggle to make a living. Lev Mon was a Khmer Rouge foot soldier until the Civil War ended a few years ago. Now he digs for gems in an uncleared minefield. Lev Mon hasn't found a stone in weeks and has been forced to borrow money to buy rice for his family. Today he's lucky. A small sapphire. He'll get about 50 cents. After a week in Pailin, we get word that the man we've been trying to see has agreed to meet us. Nguyen Chia lives far from the attractions and vices of Pailin. We're not allowed to film as we drive past several security checkpoints. Brother number two lives in a simple shack deep in the jungle. Nguyen Chia was in charge of the killing machine, a man who is uh, probably more guilty than Pol Pot himself for the actual uh, killings that went on while the Khmer Rouge were in power.
We asked Nguyen Chia what would happen if he were ever brought to trial. But he will not admit to any guilt. We had finally reached brother number two, only to get the same evasions and excuses veiled suggestions that Vietnam and the U.S. are to blame for the killings. He says his health is failing, but he seems to enjoy being on American television for the first time. On the great seal of the United States, the man who helped direct the genocide is unlikely to ever speak honestly, and his time is running out. <laughs> Evil, it seems, is an old man who calls genocide a mistake. It is the closest he comes to admitting any responsibility. Back in the capital, Cambodia is still trying to emerge from the shadow of Pol Pot. But brother number two may never be brought before a war crimes tribunal. After five years of frustrating negotiations, the United Nations has given up. In a Cambodian courtroom, petty thieves are judged while the architects of the genocide go free. The Cambodian government is still fearful of the threat of the Khmer Rouge. And Prime Minister Hun Sen has said, we should dig a hole and bury the past. So it's left to a few survivors to mark the 27th anniversary of the Khmer Rouge takeover. At tool slang, they shout against the absence of justice, the warping of memory. Inside, the curator says even his own children doubt what happened here. He worries that the evidence, like some memories, is starting to fade. He says that at the very least, a trial would force the world to acknowledge and remember the atrocities here, and allow Cambodia to start writing its own indelible history. <laughs>